Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the book of Romans, and we're in chapter 8 for the last time. We're finishing up the chapter this morning with verses 35 through 39. I was uh, looking at the announcements and uh, commented on this uh, the first service. Vicki Robertson was sitting there, and she's teaching a course in the Reformation, and the title is Kept by the Power of God. And that's really, that'd be a good title for our text this morning. It's all about the security of the believer and the assurance that we have. Well, we begin with verse 35. Paul asks the question, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word, bless our time of studying it together. Let's pray. In Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And He didn't mean He would build structures, cathedrals, chapels, and houses of worship. He meant He would establish His body, His spiritual body, the church, by saving people. They would be attacked. The gates of Hades would come against them. But hell would not prevail. He would. And not, as He said in John 17, lose one soul. Believers in Jesus Christ are secure. That's the lesson and the subject of Romans 8, verses 35 through 39, the security of the believer. It's the subject of chapter 8 of Romans, which begins with no condemnation and ends with no separation. And now, as the chapter draws to an end, Paul makes that point with a question, who will separate us from the love of Christ? This is actually the climactic question in a series of questions that Paul has asked. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Who is the one who condemns us? There are five of them. Five questions that have been described as a grand staircase that we have been climbing. And with this last question, we have arrived at the top step. The point is, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, which means Christ's love for us, not our love for Him. We would have little confidence in Paul's statement if it were about our affection for the Lord. We know how weak we are. We know how fickle we are. The assurance Paul gives here is that Christ's love will always be there. Nothing can break it. Nothing can cause Him to lose interest in us and lose His hold on us. We have a destiny. Paul explained that in verses 29 and 30. Every believer has been predestined to become conformed to the image of Christ and ultimately be glorified. There are difficulties along the way, but nothing can prevent God's goal for us from being reached. We will be victorious because of Christ's love for us. The Christian relationship to Christ has been likened to that of a mountain climber to his guide. As they ascend a dangerous precipice, the two are joined together by a strong rope. And we, like that, are joined to Christ by his unbreakable love. We pass over rough terrain and through dangers. We slip along the way, but we never fall to destruction because we're held by Him. 
The love of God is immutable. It is unchangeable. And it guarantees that we will arrive at our destination and we will enter the heavenly city. That's the point of Paul's question. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? And to make it clear that nothing can separate us from his love, Paul gives a list of hardships and afflictions that might be thought of as being able to do just that. He lists seven of them, and maybe it's seven in order to indicate completeness. The first three that he asks about are afflictions that come from a hostile world. Tribulation or distress or persecution. Uh, There are graphic terms that Paul uses here. Tribulation means pressing. It's used of treading grapes, breaking them under pressure. Distress has the idea of narrowness of space, of being in a tight spot, pressed in, which causes inner distress, inner anguish. It's, It's part of persecution. But Paul continues with famine or nakedness or peril or sword. Christians can suffer natural calamities as well as hostility. They have, and they've suffered it severely. Paul reinforces this with a quote from Psalm 44, verse 22, which is a plea for God's deliverance in a time of persecution. Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, they they weren't, those suffering saints in the psalm, weren't suffering because they had forgot the Lord or because they had, had turned to false gods, and this was some form of discipline on them. Not at all. They were suffering due to their loyalty to the Lord. They were suffering for His sake. And so in the psalm, the people express bewilderment over their experience. But it's not an uncommon experience for God's people. And that's what Paul wants to ensure us in our understanding of. This is not uncommon. This is what the Scriptures teach. Well, we see it in the Scriptures as well, but we also see it in history, and we see it in our own history. The Pilgrims and Puritans who came to New England to build a shining city on a hill suffered greatly in those first years. John Winthrop, the governor of Massachusetts, wrote in his journal of how the fevers and scurvy were taking so many of them, not sparing the righteous, he wrote. Even the righteous were being killed. Now that's not what we expect. We tend to think that because God loves us, we will escape hardship and difficulty. But again, Paul uses the psalm to show that we shouldn't be surprised by suffering, especially persecution. And perhaps through this verse, the Holy Spirit was preparing the church of Rome for its suffering because a few years later, There would be a reign of terror under the Emperor Nero. Philip Schaff in his church history called it a carnival of blood. For his sadistic entertainment, Nero made Christians into human torches to light his gardens at night. Now to to most of us who have never suffered physical persecution, that seems like an exotic page out of ancient history, but History is full of such episodes. One of the great chapters of church history is that of the Huguenots, the 16th century French Calvinists. Many were noblemen and merchants who had embraced the Reformation. In fact, the Reformation in France had really taken hold within the middle class of France. And it was a minority, but a large minority, but because it was a large minority, They were terribly persecuted. They were branded as heretics by the Catholic Church. They were put under harsh laws, and thousands were slaughtered. More than once, the rivers of France ran red with their blood and bodies, and many of them wondered why. Why did God remain silent? Had He rejected them? Some 
concluded that he had. And they interpreted their hardships as proof that they had been wrong in the adoption of the Reformation and they returned to the Catholic Church. Some did, but most didn't. They remained confident that God would vindicate them. As one writer put it, they clung to the hope that the church never triumphs except under the cross. And that's true. Under the cross, there's difficulty. That's a stumbling block to the unbeliever. It's an offense to the unbeliever. So if we cling to the cross and we preach the cross, we can expect opposition and hardship. But that's where we triumph. We triumph under the cross. Suffering is often surprising to us, but it shouldn't be. The Bible is clear. God's love is sure. It cannot be shaken, but trouble will also come. Paul knew that from experience. He not only wrote about suffering, he suffered everything he wrote about. Imprisonments and beatings, hunger, exposure, and ultimately the sword. And yet Paul never doubted God's love for him in any of that, nor would he even in his final dying moment when the sword was drawn for him. In fact, Paul writes in verse 37 that moments of distress and martyrdom are occasions of victory, not defeat or loss. But in all these things, he writes, we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. The King James Version borrowed the translation of the Geneva Bible, which is, we are more than conquerors. Or it can be translated very literally, super conquerors. Martyrdom seems to be a defeat, not victory. But not to Paul. It is victory and more, super victory. A conquest that is over and above normal victory. We are more than conquerors. That's what Paul says. We see it right here, but still we wonder how such a great conquest can be described to us, or ascribed to us, rather, such, uh, through such terrible suffering and disease and death, all these trials. How can we speak of that as conquering and super-conquering? Well, it's because ultimately we're not hurt by them, not eternally. Temporally, yes, but not eternally. And Because through them, the saint comes out with a firmer faith, more fervent love, and a larger capacity for eternal joy. That is, when we receive these things through faith and submission and obedience, they work to our benefit, ultimately. Well, we may not see it all together, but that's the assurance that Scripture gives us. And to remain faithful through such crushing trials is itself a victory. But Paul explains it. It's not because of anything in us. That's not what he's saying. We have victory and we are more than conquerors because of Jesus Christ. That's what he says. We conquer through Him who loved us. Now, loved us is, as you can see in the past tense, and the the specific force of this past tense in Greek is, uh, looks to a point in time. And the point in time, or the point in history that it's, that Paul is looking at, is the cross. That's the greatest display of love that ever occurred. When Christ sealed the victory for His people by conquering sin and death and the devil. It happened there at the cross. And nothing, he's saying, can separate us from that great act of love. And nothing can undo Christ's work on the cross for us. His people will eternally be victors and examples of His victory. But Paul isn't restricting God's love to the past and to one act. The love that put Christ on the cross for us is still for us daily. And because God's love is for us, 
we experience the victory of the cross in our lives daily. God causes all things to work together for good, Paul has said. That's true for every believer in Jesus Christ. So that love and that work of God is constantly going on for us. Well, in everything, and that includes affliction. It's really something of the subject here. It's used for our good, which means we triumph through it. That's a triumph. When even in affliction, and even in difficulty, and even in the sorrows of life, there's victory and triumph in that. So we read the psalmist in Psalm 119 who says, It is good that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. That, that, that's not the kind of thing we, we think of, is it? It is good that I was afflicted. And you know, that's the psalmist. And that's Paul here. Now look, affliction, sorrow, suffering, death, these are not good things. They are evil in themselves. They are what has occurred because of the fall and the condition of this world which is under judgment. And they will someday be done away with. That's the promise of Scripture and that's our hope. God will wipe away every tear from our eyes, we're told. In the meantime, in this fallen world, God is able to use all of that for our good, for our growth, so that we triumph in it and over it. He uses affliction to further the faith, to cause the gospel to spread. A few years after writing to the Romans, Paul was in prison. Paul wrote this book from Corinth. But a few years later, he's in Rome and in prison, and from prison he wrote to the Philippians about how his imprisonment had turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. So after telling the Romans about being a conqueror through suffering, Paul was a model of it, which encouraged the Roman church to be more than conquerors and spread the gospel. That's what he tells the Philippians. And he tells them how through his ministry in chains, soldiers of the Praetorian Guard, the, the emperor's bodyguard, and even members of Caesar's household had been brought to faith. So his imprisonment was a victory. As I'm sure his death was. I, I wonder what Paul must have said to his executioner and how his words and conduct at death affected those who were there. It, it's reasonable, I think, to think about that and to assume that they were moved by his calmness and his hope and his joy as he faced the sword and reasonable even to think that some of them became believers as a result of what he said and what he did, how he behaved. He was even in death a super conqueror. There are many spectators on our lives, on your lives. People who see us in times of suffering and who are affected by it. People you know, people you don't know. And, and our response to the difficulties of life brings glory to God. There are spectators that we don't even see. We know that from the book of Job where there is a, a whole other dimension to things from, from what we see and what we know. There is an angelic audience. In fact, there you know the, the scene opens up in the first two chapters of Satan coming before God and talking about Job. He'd been examining his life. He'd been watching his life. Well, the angels, good and evil, observe what goes on. In fact, Paul mentions in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10 that the wisdom of God is made known through the church to the angels, to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. They watch, our, they watch, they watch us here. They see what's going on here. I assume they learn from the things that we, we speak from the pulpit or in our classes. But they see us in life as well. They see our struggles and they see our faith and they marvel at God's grace in us because that God's grace 
is what gives us strength to prevail. <clears throat> to prevail over famine, to prevail over the sword. Fever and scurvy and sword can kill the righteous, but they cannot kill God's love for us, which keeps us faithful to Him, and which promises great reward for all who are faithful unto the end. But even when our love for Him and our faithfulness to Him fail, and they do, we fail continually. But even when we fail, His love for us never fails. That's the assurance that Paul gives. We are secure. And in verses 38 and 39, he describes God's love for us as undying love and unbreakable love. He does this by considering every possible way that separation from God might occur. He gives ten possibilities and eliminates each of them. Nothing, he says, can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He was absolutely convinced of that. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Most of these uh, possibilities are put into pairs of opposites to show the completeness of the impossibility of separation from Christ. The first pair is death and life, two opposites, and he's saying everything in between. But death can't separate us. Well, really, that says it all right there. Death is the end. Death is the king of terrors. It separates us from the world. It separates us from everything that we know. It separates us from everything we love. And death is permanent. That's it. But Paul says it can't separate the believer in Jesus Christ from God's love. In fact, it is the very means of bringing us into His very presence and that of all of the saints. Death becomes a blessing. And we become more than conquerors in it. So death can't separate us from God's love. And neither can life. Now, we might wonder, well, how, how could life separate us? And it may be that Paul is just being rhetorical here and saying that uh, nothing between these two extremes can come between us and God. But he may mean that, that life and all of its pleasures, all of its temptations, all of its diversions, which can make the heart grow cold toward heaven, None of that can separate us from His love. Neither can all the, ange the angels together. If, if, if the heavenly angels and the fallen angels were able to join forces, uh, an impossible idea, but, but if they were able to do that, and, uh, and all of the angelic hosts came against us, not even they could separate us from Christ. Nothing in the present can. Nothing in the future can. No failure on our part today, no unseen failure in the future can overthrow God's love for you and break the tie that binds Him to us. Go as high up as you can and search the heavens. Go as far down as you can into the abyss. You won't find anything great enough to separate us from Christ's love. Now, some have argued that, that Paul doesn't really mean that, not in the absolute sense, that what he's doing here is focusing on forces outside of us, but, but not in our own heart. The not, he's not speaking of the believer's own free and responsible choices, and that we ourselves can. So what can separate us from the love of God and the love of Christ? What can separate us? Well, we can. But Paul answers that objection with his last category, which really closes all possible loopholes by stating, 
nor any other created thing. Now, are we created things? Well, yes. And that means, that means not even we can frustrate God's purpose of salvation for us and will ourselves or choose to put ourselves out of His love. Not that we would seek to do that. A true believer perseveres in faith, continues in it. That's how God's love keeps us. The, the God who gives saving faith in regeneration continues to give it in sanctification. He's constantly giving us that faith. He's constantly supplying us with that faith, just as He's the one who's constantly supplying you with every moment of your life and existence. The God who chose His people unconditionally in eternity past, knowing the kind of people we would be, knowing the, the mistakes that we would make and the sins we would commit, and chose us anyway, is not shaken from His love for us when we sin, now that we are His sons, and now that we are His children. If He chose us when we were His enemies... He won't forsake us now that we're His children. As Paul put it in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13, if we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. So after looking at this matter from every angle, from time and space and things, from powers, human and angelic, natural and supernatural, Paul assures believers of their eternal security. Nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And with that, Paul comes full circle. He began, who will separate us from the love of Christ? And now nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God. The two are the same. The love of the Son and the love of the Father are the same love. Because the two are the same God. They're not the same person. The Father isn't the Son and the Son isn't the Father, but they are two persons of the one God. Nothing can separate us from the love of the triune God, is what he's saying. Which can only be known, that love can only be known through Christ by faith in Him. Which is precisely the teaching of Christ Himself in Matthew 16, that nothing can separate us from this love. He says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. We will not be defeated by the greatest evil powers in this universe. That's what he taught elsewhere. He taught that in John chapter 10, where he assures us of the believer's security. It's that great chapter on the Good Shepherd and how he deals with his sheep, and how he protects and keeps his sheep. And he says in chapter 10, verses 27 through 29, that he knows his sheep. He gives eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. But he continues on, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. I am not the Father. He's not the Son, but we are the same God. Well, now that's strong assurance. No one can snatch them out of the hand of the Son and out of the hand of the Father. No one. Well, well who falls outside of that statement? No one. It, it can't be more comprehensive and absolute than that. The devil can't snatch us out of his hand. He can't prevail against the hand of God. Bad teachers and bad company can't cause us to be dislodged from the love of God and the power of God. You can't, not unless you are stronger than the power of God. The believer in Jesus Christ, weak as we all are, the believer in Jesus Christ is kept by the almighty love of the triune God. 
Charles Spurgeon explained our security from John chapter 10 by describing us as not only in the Lord's hand, but part of his hand. Christ is the head, and we are members of his body. So Mr. Spurgeon asked, will Christ lose his members? How could Christ be perfect if he lost one of his members? How could he be perfect if he, if he lost his little finger? Are Christ's members to rot off or to be cut off? Impossible, he said. If you have faith in Christ, you are a partaker in Christ. You are a partaker in his life, and his life is eternal life. We cannot perish. If men were trying to drown me, he wrote, they could not drown my foot as long as I had my head above water. And as long as our head, speaking of Christ, is above water, up yonder in the eternal sunshine, the least limb of his body can never be destroyed. He that believeth in Christ is united to him, and he must live because Jesus lives, Spurgeon wrote. Now that's true. We are as secure as Christ is secure. Now that doesn't mean that we won't have difficulties and challenges. We will. We see that right here. He lists all the different challenges and difficulties that we may go through, and there are more to be listed than, than that. We will go through the waters, the waters of trial and difficulty. And so we need to know that. And we need to prepare ourselves for that. This is what Paul is saying in verse 36. He quotes the psalm. The, the people of that psalm are, are perplexed. Why are we going through this? And Paul cites it here to, to say, in effect, these are things we can suffer, but they can't separate us from the love of God. Now, I say we need to prepare ourselves for that. We do. And how do we do that? Well, we do it by doing what we're doing right here, studying the Word of God. And you do that on your own. You read the Bible. You study the Bible. But it is as we do that that we prepare ourselves. And, and in so doing, that's how our faith is established and it grows. It, 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 it grows through the study of God's Word. That's what you must give yourself to what we all must give ourselves to and live obedient to it. We take each day as it comes. Our, our progress is often slow. It's like a boy climbing a snowy hill. I used to do that. Uh, first 11 years of my life were lived in Kansas City, which gets snow every year, usually about January, maybe a little earlier sometimes. And it's a great time for a kid because there's snow and there are hills and you find a tall hill like we used to do up by the, one of the high schools and take your sled and go down and that was great but then you had to go back up and I can remember going up and slipping and falling and slipping and falling but I always made it to the top. And that's the Christian life. That's the way it is. It's slow. It's, it's, it's just full of, of stumbling but we are assured to get to the top. And so, we speak of eternal security as the perseverance of the saints. We will persevere to the end. Not because we produce the perseverance. Our confidence, our strength is not in our love for God. It's in His love for us. He is steadfast. And so really, the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints is better named the perseverance of God with the saints or the preservation of the saints. That's what John Newton wrote about in his hymn, Amazing Grace, and the stanza, Through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. It will lead us home. Our pilgrimage through this world is full of dangers and snares, temptations and traps. But God keeps us safe, and He will lead us all safely home. Nothing 
can separate us from His love. Well, that's the promise of Romans 8. The chapter began with no condemnation. It ends with no separation. That assurance is for everyone who is in Christ, every believer, weak or strong, every believer. But it's only for believers. Everyone else stands outside of Christ. Everyone else stands condemned and separated and, and will be separated for all eternity. John, in the last chapter of, <clears throat> toward the end of that chapter, uh, 1 John, 1 John 5, says the whole world, he's speaking of the whole unbelieving world, the whole world lies in the evil one. Now that's a terrifying statement. You are in the hand, if you're an unbeliever, of the evil one, of Satan, who is malicious and arbitrary. What an uncertain and doomed condition that is. So if you have not believed in Christ, believe in Him. Realize that you are a sinner under God's just condemnation and that judgment will someday come. Jesus Christ, God's eternal Son, became a perfect man for the purpose of dying in the place of sinners so that everyone who believes in Him would escape that judgment, would be saved and have life everlasting. So come to Him. Enter Him through faith and be saved. Well, it's a great chapter. I think we should end with a great hymn. Let's stand and sing hymn number 227 in the Red Book, Amazing Grace, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn 227.